Thanks, Lee. I cannot honestly imagine a better group to be talking to today. And I really hope for a um, spirited conversation at the end of this. So we, Betsy, Chris and I really just wanna share with you uh, a series of thoughts and initiatives that we've put together since September of last year when the mayor assigned this group of citizens to come together um, with their expertise to think big, to think about the vision um, for this place. It's really been a remarkable experience. Um, we were such a large and talented group that we broke down into separate areas of expertise. And um, that was such a fantastic strategy because it allowed each of us to concentrate on what we know best to bring to the mayor and to the city our best foot forward. So uh, for me today is about just in encouraging all of us to do exactly what you all are thinking about and that's engaging with the city, engaging in policy. Uh, I can't imagine this particular project um, kicking itself off without this really serious investigation and series of recommendations to the city council. So let's um, begin with just some slides. We've got some uh, slides that are prepared in some ways by the city and some by our committee groups, but um, this is uh, the planning, the beginning of the planning for the revitalization of the Civic Center core properties, of which there are many, so we can go through those. But if thinking about the history um, of the site, thinking about what our city hall was um, years ago, uh, what it became in 1965, and what it can be going forward. So here are the sites. Um, we have the city administration building to the left, which um, we all know so well from gaining permit access for our building projects. That's one site. And that site will be separated um, as an independent site. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, as opposed to the other five, which include 101 Ash, the city hall building, Golden Hall, um, the Civic Theater, um, the Tower, and um, all of those together become this Civic Center project. Who are the committee members? Really a fantastic group of people uh, of which I'm really honored to be a part. And uh, it was to meet all these people and have these intense conversations every two weeks to bring information to the table. Um, nothing more rewarding, frankly. And uh, so then we reduced our uh, group effort to a series of subgroups, the downtown partnership that Betsy Brennan led, tourism, which Julie Coker led, economic development, Steve Cushman, and civic center design. And let's use design in the broadest sense of the word, uh, which our, our studio led. We met, met bi-weekly, we had frequent subgroup meetings, and then we have spe had speakers come, including um, particular Mar Marty Poirier, who is the landscape architect in San Diego, and really came to talk about um, what happened at the last version of this effort and how could we do better this time. So we're, we were not against looking at the pros, the cons, the mistakes, the triumphs, and everything that's happened um, in our city to develop a, a civic core. So uh, here's a moment where I think, Betsy, would you mind coming in and just really talking about how your group approached this assignment? Sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, it was great to be part of the mayor's working group and to work with Jennifer and everyone else on the committee. And at the downtown partnership, we also wanted to really engage the downtown community and our membership at the downtown partnership, but more than just our membership. So we wanted to take the 300 businesses that are members of the downtown partnership and our, we wanted to take our mission really seriously, which is economic prosperity and cultural vitality of downtown San Diego, 
And then how do we engage the 12,000 parcel owners in downtown, the 37,000 residents in downtown and really just start those conversations. So we had a subcommittee that was led by uh, Perry Dealey and Dan, Daniel Reeves. And just, just to start that public engagement and community engagement, and that's just the start because this is an iterative process that's going to go on for quite some time. Uh, but as a reminder, the city council will be hearing this, has heard this item several times as information items, and will be at uh, the Land Use and Housing Committee, which I'm sure Chris Ackerman Avila will talk a little bit more just this Thursday. Uh, but we really wanted to solicit as much input as possible to bring back to the mayor's committee and back and forth and back and forth. Those committee meetings of the mayors were were open to the public, but we wanted to make sure as much as possible that we got the word out that those meetings were happening and that this project was being contemplated yet again. So maybe for the third or fourth formal time, this project was in the public's eye again, and the revitalization of the six civic blocks were being considered. So I uh, really love being on the committee with all of these people, but how, how do we better engage the public how do we get all of these ideas on the table? And so that was really our, what we wanted to focus on at the Downtown San Diego Partnership. And we did have hundreds of people um, participate either through their company or through our membership, but we know that that's just the beginning of the process and we um, expect much more public participation as the months uh, go forward. So I will leave it at that for now, Jennifer, and happy to be part of this conversation today with you and many uh, of my colleagues and our colleagues here um, today. Wonderful, Betsy, thank you. So <clears throat> our group, uh, which was involved with design, and I have to say that's an expans expansive subject matter because we had so many wonderful uh, subcommittee members, including um, Martha Gilmer from the San Diego Symphony to talk about arts and culture. Uh, so think about our group as the global um, thinkers around design strategy. So knowing how we think as architects and how we process a project, we thought we'd, we'd approach it that way. So really, essentially, we came up with this term civicness. And we said, what is, is it going to take? to search and find the civicness of San Diego? And how can we bring that to the center, to the core? Um, how can we create a heart for our city, which has been lacking and really non-existent for, for so long? And I, Lee mentioned this Center for Design um, project, which we tried to get off the ground. And that was really the first, the beginning of thinking about how can we as designers, as professional design professionals, help to make that heart of the city. So what, as a group, we came up with was this notion that we need to be strong, we need to be articulate, and we need to be clear about the ideas that we're putting forward. And what historically have been the ways that that's happened, um, it's to look back at the history um, to think about precedence, what's happening in the rest of the world, and, and find global examples that can encourage a sense of optimism and um, inspiration for our civic leaders to proceed and to really make this project happen. It is going to take them to do it. So we thought about how we can articulate, and maybe Kirsten could go to the next slide. So we wrote a manifesto and that manifesto was, was clarified and clarified and reduced and reduced until it really became a document that felt powerful to us. Here we are communicating a group of ideas to a series of city council members and the mayor and their staff. 
how can we make that the strongest thing possible? So we wrote a manifesto together and that, that was just fantastic experience because we just went back and forth with the language and everybody brought their expertise to the table. But essentially what we're saying, oops, can you go back, sorry, <laughs> um, is that our city is poised to embark upon a once in a lifetime transformation of our downtown civic center giving us the proud heart and soul that we all deserve. We realize that it's going to take audacious thinking, broad outreach, strong partnerships, and thoughtful planning to guarantee the success of this time. We realize this is once in a lifetime, and we've communicated this to everyone we can, that now is San Diego's moment. There's so much happening in our city that's so exciting. How can this project really represent that um, amazing energy. So what makes great civicness? I'm sure there are so many more things than this, but this is how we parsed it down to the most um, important ways that we could really exude exceptional design strategies throughout the idea of this project. So let me just list those and then we'll go through each one. To celebrate democracy, that is the essential idea of the Civic Center. To build trust, trust in community, government, uh, amongst us all as citizens. Honoring public service. Um, the staff of the city work in terrible conditions at this point. How can we honor them by building a, a, a humane place to work? Demanding design excellence. How can we demand from anyone involved in this project that they should be thinking thoughtfully and expansively? Embracing arts and culture, that arts and culture are the core of our being and that it should be a distinct part of the project itself. How do we create dynamic municipal synergies? There are so many aspects to this project that are going to come together and how can we make sure that each of the entities speak to each other? How do we center the network? This is a moment where we could potentially have this heart become the transportation hub for our city. We must listen. Every successful project in the city has come out of listening to community and conversing with them, having a conversation. Um, we have to address housing needs. This project is not gonna solve the problem, but it is going to be an intrinsic example of how housing needs can be answered in our downtown core. We have to commit to climate action this project is going to be and must be the example for the future. We have to ensure safety and inclusiveness in everything and every strategy throughout the project. On an aspirational level, we have to take risks. And um, this, this is a subject I'll get into a little bit later, but um, that one is super important to us. And we have to shift paradigms, paradigms of what we think civicness is, what we think a downtown core is, and what's the future. So pulling together the first three, um, we have to celebrate democracy, build trust, and honor public service. I won't go through all the details, but we looked to global precedent. Um, and it's really just a, an effort to inspire the teams. They're gonna come together to compete for this project. And we just happened to have selected months ago, uh, the City Hall in London by Foster Partners. Um, turns out that's quite a coincidence. Um, but you know, this project really um, honors those who work in it and support the City of London. It's become a, quite an amazing iconic um, element in the city and something that feels inspirational. The City Hall um, proposal in South Korea by Snoetta, uh, a place of lightness, inspiration, uh, inclusiveness, and democracy. We need to include all of those things in this project. And thinking about the past and the future, thinking uh, about architecturally how the Marin County Civic Center was so 
forward thinking in its time in 1960 and how Zaha's uh, proposal for Elk Grove does the same thing in 2016. What will our proposal do for the future? Image of what civicness is. We have to demand design excellence. So many levels of thinking around that. And I want our community to come together to really define those things. And so there's so much more work to be done. But inspirational things like the Opera House um, by Snoeta in Oslo, a building that you actually occupy at all levels. How could we possibly think about doing that with our amazing climate and this incredibly large site? Lincoln Center came up so much in our conversations, this notion of transforming a, an essentially brutalist series of buildings to ones that are incredibly welcoming, transparent and inviting. They become social, civic, and um, they include an incredible sense about landscape and open space and public space. And, and treat it so differently than it was in the 1960s. And here we have an image of it today where it becomes this amazing campus of invitation, inclusion, and, and a wonderful example about how we could potentially even renovate, restore some of the buildings on the site to become something um, of today and the future. And thinking about the intimacy of public space for community, um, we always refer to Paley Park in New York City as a wonderful transformation. And thinking about how we can have grand public space that is civic and then the, is intimate moments as well. Embracing arts and culture. Um, We've had such a, a plethora of amazing new projects in the city, including the Rady Shell. Um, that have centered the downtown core as the arts and culture destination for the city. And how can this project um, advance that, that notion? So we come up with these series of recommendations. And the first recommendation is that we must rehabilitate or rebuild the Civic Theater on the site. It's critical to the future of arts and culture in the downtown core. It completes a circle of wonderful projects, including the renovation of Symphony Hall that's happening today. Um, this is an important initiative. It's one that high, we highly recommend to any of the teams um, looking, looking at this project. It also requires us to think really carefully about how to continue the use of the project as it is now, the theater, to keep people employed, to keep uh, civic um, and cultural events happening even during this renovation process. Looking at projects again as examples, the Disney Hall, of course, a landmark now, an architectural wonder in a way, <clears throat> but one of the most important spaces to experience music um, in this country, actually. And our own Rady Shell, <clears throat> everything the Shell has done for our city has come from audacious, careful, thoughtful thinking about how public private space um, is engaged. And Millennium Park in Chicago, one that combines performance, art, um, gathering. These are all examples that we bring to city council as, as inspiration for them to be encouraged to be the leaders that will move this project forward. And then, you know, on the simplest level of installation, um, looking at the urban light project at LACMA in Los Angeles, that it, it fosters community pride. And how can we do that? This is the most Instagrammed image in um, Los Angeles at this point, and it's art. So let's, let's understand the power of art. The fourth manifesto grouping was to create dynamic synergies and center the network. So we began thinking about how all these entities could collaborate together, something that we do in our projects, all of us as professionals, this notion of bringing leadership together. But that 
translated again into one specific area of interest, which was thinking about um, that we must create a master plan for this project. It can't be a series of individual projects that don't speak to each other, including the idea of building a city hall on the operations site versus building the civic project. And how can we um, center that network with a transportation hub? So we looked at things, can we go back for a sec, just quick, um, the World Trade Center, the Oculus, how many different entities were involved in that project? It's incredibly complicated, but unbelievably successful. So um, our, our next recommendation is to include a hub for public transportation on the site of the Civic Center. This is our moment to really be able to do that. What it brings to the site is an equitable access to civic life. Um, it's sustainable in the sense that it's um, thinking about climate action and it's increasing, increasing housing density because it allows people to be transported to and from work. So we had a wonderful, uh, presentation by Sandag um, about a project that they already have uh, in mind. And they've already explored this very site. So here's a not a, a global example, but a local example of a group really thinking about how can we do a multi-level project um, that allows transportation to and from the downtown core to the airport, to North County, to the border. And their studies really begin to understand that this is possible. So we're not just thinking about building a civic center on grade. We're talking about a whole system that could be a part of a really, really exciting project. Manifesto 5 is about listening, investing in community outreach. The city, the mayor, Chris and his team have already trusted that that is a powerful tool. And so our committees have gone out to the community and talked to them and invited them to give us ideas. This has got to be a part of this process. And I use our Minge example as, as a good one because we began that community outreach from day one and we never had anyone question the initiatives in any of the voting processes because everyone was on board to begin with from from the start because you know that the project told a, a really important community story and we really believe that that's what the civic project can do as well and then addressing housing scarcity clearly a major issue for our city for every city in the united states um, committing to climate action no question essential and ensuring diversity, inclusiveness, and safety. All of those things come together. We uh, did a broadband search um, of housing initiatives in every city up and down the West Coast. And um, this is just one example in Los Angeles, the Rose Apartments, which really deal with uh, 35 affordable units. Um, and this project has been really the, the star project of the city of Los Angeles for housing those who are coming off the street, looking for work. And yet architecturally it won an AIA, a huge AIA award as well. So it's, it's this notion that we as professionals can be, become a part of this building of this fabric in our city and have it be critical um, for the health and wellness of our, our community. So we made another recommendation to consider local and regional plans to maximize housing opportunities. So this site is only a part of a bigger nexus of area that we need to understand that this site is not gonna answer the, all the questions, but this site is a part of the bigger answer. And so we would suggest and recommend and hopefully mandate that um, any developer 
who participates in this project needs to provide a mix of housing opportunities, affordable, missing middle, co-living, micro units, market rate, luxury, so many possibilities that um, we need to see that variety. And the project needs to be forward thinking in terms of sustainability. We use the Salesforce, Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco as an example where the entire roof is occupied. We see some just amazingly exciting opportunities with this site. And then finally, taking risks. And um, when we first presented this to city council, uh, there was a sense that taking risks meant spending money frivolously. And that's not our point whatsoever. It's this idea of taking the risk to be forward thinking, to think outside the box in terms of funding and how funding is acquired and utilized, to think about the future of a city as opposed to relying on previous examples and shifting the paradigms of how we understand what a civic center can be. What's the future of civicness? And so we really gave um, city council examples of audacious thinking, things that were never thought of, Central Park and how it has changed the face of Manhattan. And then let's go to our own city and talk about how Balpo, Balboa Park changed everything. And then add the layer of the Panama Exposition to Balboa Park and, and how we became a destination on the map because of those two things. And then a gesture, a simple gesture like the High Line in New York, it has transformed the west side of Manhattan in so many ways. It's become iconic. How can we create a place that does the same for our city? So in the spirit of great civic endeavors of San Diego's past, we're inspired by the visionary tenacity of its civic leaders to imagine the impossible and think beyond the moment to a legacy for the future. Our new civic center must epitomize San Diego as a city of science, the arts, courage by national regional cooperation, our recommendation is more than what a project looks like or one that states which buildings to tear down, but an urgent call for holistic design in the broad sense. We have one chance to get this right, a legacy project that is an opportunity to level up the city's economic, aesthetic, and societal value. Our leaders must engage the community and think big to develop an innovative civic center that will serve our city now and in the future. So that's sort of the culmination of six, seven months of work together. Um, we're really passionate about it and we need our our community to gather around um, these ideas, expand upon them, um, speak to city council about them, and really encourage this project to move forward in its best foot, foot forward. Thanks, Jen. I posted in the chat for everyone. Um, I, I wanted you to be prepared or welcome and willing and able to make comments, ask questions, engage with Jennifer Luce, as well as Chris Ackerman, Avila, and Betsy Brennan, who are all here representing kind of different frontiers of the Civic Center revitalization effort. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to anyone. And I see Phil Bona has his hand raised. So let's go with Phil. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. So um, really a brilliant uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so some of you may know that I came from, uh, came to San Diego from the CCDC world. And in 2008, um, we did all of this under mm -hmm. CCDC. I'm a little disappointed that none of the value of that exercise 
and all of the 23, I believe, public meetings that we had were left out of this and wondering why. Um, I, I can speak to it a little bit and maybe Chris also, but we actually did have a very extensive um, meeting fill around talking about that effort. Uh, the things that went right, the things that went wrong. Um, and we attempted to fold in many of the great initiatives and also talk about the notion that maybe civic leadership needs to be strengthened around the effort uh, in, a, in a broader sense this time around. So we, we did really have many conversations with you know, players in, in that um, project itself. <clears throat> Did you include Zimmer Gunzel Frasca in those conversations? No, we did not. Although I um, remember we, we did hear from, from Marty Poirier, who's also on the line here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's important to note that compared to the, the process that was followed a decade ago, 15 years ago, actually, um, this time around, the process is going to be very different. This time we have the state requirements from the Surplus Lands Act. Um, where we're planning to get you know, to dispose of five of the six blocks and just really focus on, on one block, which is the, the, the block furthest to the west um, that Jennifer pointed out in the beginning. Um, and with that, that carries very specific state requirements um, in terms of you know, the, the number one requirement having to be the number of homes that are provided in the development. Um, so, you know, although we did have that one, that one committee meeting where we had Marty um, you know, kind of take us back to the 2008-2009 process. Um, we're also acknowledging that this time around will be different, um, you know, but we, we certainly were paying attention to, to, to that previous process. Um, you know, behind the scenes, we also um, were looking at all the reports that were made from that process, including the Rules Committee presentation from 2009. Um, you know, it, we, have, we had a very large binder of that sort of information, um, that staff looked at, um, but but again, this is only the beginning of that process, and, and that doesn't mean that in the future we can't have those future um, those past um, conversations uh, brought back up again. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so Michael Stepner, I saw your hand was up. I don't see it anymore. And then as well, it, we'll, well, it went well away. hang on. Then we'll go to Scott Lewis. And then we'll go to Myra, and then we'll go to Bill Anderson. Is that good? Oh, me now? Okay. Um, oh. oh, Mike. Mike, are you? you do I'm you here. Yeah. Okay. I, I just want I, I, an outstanding presentation, and you know I can sympathize with with what Phil said because in 1972 I was assigned to do a study of how to replace the civic center, which was considered obsolete the day it was. The ribbon was cut on it. Mm. But one of the things I think is really important about the process that you have gone through with this today and you're going through right now is the manifesto. I think that stating those principles, why those principles are important, is something that is good for this project. But as importantly, it's something that should be attached as a process to every civic project that comes along, whether it's a park mm. or a library or a fire station. How do we make a city whole by really looking at what a project is supposed to do. So I'm just giving you my rant. Thank you. I'll hang up. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Mike. Scott Lewis. Well, thanks again for including me. And, and uh, it's great to, to see this. Can I just orient um, and one, I'm just curious, uh, Chris, you just mentioned but the plan was to dispose of five blocks and to focus on one block. Um, one block is a lot different than six or five blocks. Um, and, and the ambitions that she's outlined in her presentation would be pretty restrained in just one block. Is, is the plan uh, or what, what's, what's the status of the plan to maybe just build a, a new city hall and, and move on with the rest and let developers handle the rest of that? What, what, is there even an opening for the ambitions that she's outlined there? That's a great clarifying point right there, Scott. Um, the, the vision is that, that Jennifer Luce's team presented 
in terms of the design is for both the city hall and then also for those other five blocks. I think it's an important point that the Jennifer's team said that these two projects um, need to speak to each other. They can't be walled off from one another. So this, this um, the recommendations that were provided to the mayor, um, part of the recommendations were to have the, the block furthest west be um, a separate process, a public works project um, by the city, that, that will be the city hall, and then separately dispose of the five blocks, which will be um, uh, following the Surplus Lands Act, but they, they both need to follow the recommendations and divisions set out by the committee. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that, that clarifies that, um, but, but that the five blocks will also be following that vision that's laid out. Okay, thank you, Scott. Can I tag on to that? I just have a quick question just as a tag on to what you, what you said. Is there real structures in place that will hold the developers accountable to that? Or is it just the idea that, you know, it's a good faith effort? Oh, yeah. So, you know, so, so I can compare it to potentially to the sports arena process where you see that there's consistent community engagement and lots of, um, you know, public uh, engagement in that. So we we are planning to have the either the committee as a whole um, or the subgroup and, and the chair of the committee, the subgroup chairs, meet with um, each of the teams that, that are submitting bids and making sure that number one, they they're they're you know uh, doing the best they can to actually um, abide by the recommendations that were set out by the committee, and then also of course setting out those public engagement requirements. The sports arena project, for example, um, has quarterly updates into the city council, and they're constantly doing community engagement. Um, events as well. They've they've had two of them, I, I think at least two of them so far. Um, so, you know, regardless of, um, you know, how many bids are submitted um, and who's ultimately selected for this, uh, for these five blocks, um, they're definitely going to be meeting with the committee and having um, engagement with the public to make sure that, um, you know, there, there's consistent um, and continuous public feedback. Okay. Thank you again, Chris. Uh, Myra, let's go to your question. Hi, thank you. I'm very excited to hear this, um, all of this dialogue and um, waited until now to try to get involved. Um, I'm a former city employee. I worked in development services and planning for 30 years, retired a couple of years ago. Um, so I, I was there when this was starting to be discussed. And I was also on the, the city side team with Civic San Diego for the 2008 effort. So I, I remember all that process. Um, and one of the things that we dealt with during that process was the potential eligibility for designation for the concourse, um, the parking structure, and as well as the historicity of the Civic Center itself. And so my questions kind of revolve a little bit around that and how you guys, have you talked about it at all in any of your meetings? Um, there was uh, documentation done. We had the reports. You should, you guys should have that if you received a binder um, for the project. But I think that that's a, an important component to wrap into your arts and culture. Um, that's the first thing is talking about the historicity and how you ensure that that's not lost in the process either, um, especially the mosaics in the in the community concourse area. And also, if you've engaged in any with any of the tribal community um, yet, uh, that was also one of the things that has come up that's new to the city, not now new, but it's, you know, since 2005 is tribal consultation and also engaging them in their thoughts um, about the tribal history and the, the cultural component um, that could be brought into this as well. That kind of helps tell the story of how the, the San Diego and City Hall and San Diego itself um, uh, has become part of the overall community. And just, I, I think it's important to reach out to them at some point that may be later on, but it doesn't hurt to engage them now and, and get some of their opinions about it. But um, I'm really excited to find out how I can be a part of this process. Having worked on, I, I was staffed to Civic San Diego for all of the down, most of the downtown development I worked on, a lot of the projects. I worked on the Menge for the environmental um, and that was part of my role with Civic. But um, my career was public projects basically at the city. And so I'd like to 
I'd like to do something in my retirement that's meaningful as well. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to be there to participate in this. So I'm throwing my hat in there. So thanks. <laughs> okay. Do you want to go ahead and start, Jen? Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all of those uh, suggestions and um, thoughtful responses. I We do have our committee kind of set, but we all have expanded that to conversation groups and we would love to have you be a part of that. Um, this, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And um, so if you want, if you can join, that would be fantastic because that level of um, knowledge and wisdom is much, is much needed. And we're just really at the beginning of um, refining this series of recommendations. Yeah, you know, and to just carry off of that, um, I see it as a three-part question. The first about involvement. Um, I, I will share, we have a website actually, um, and I'll put that in the chat right now, um, where you can do a lot of things. You Number one, you can sign up to stay updated on opportunities for future engagement. Um, you can see a couple of memos, uh, public comments that we received, reports, that's the final report. Um, each of the working groups made some reports and they had some, some um, accompanying materials. You can see all the meetings that we had, um, including meeting agendas. Each of the meetings were recorded. And then for all the presentations that we received, we also um, uploaded all the background material um, for each of these meetings. So it's essentially all the conversations that we've had so far um, documented online. Um, and this is going to be the website where we continue to upload um, just to memorialize our conversations. Um, so at the very top, if you want to sign up for email updates, please make sure to do so. Um, and then also the first big opportunity for involvement will be tomorrow, um, where we're going to the uh, Land Use and Housing Committee to start that process of, of um, the Surplus Lands Act. So if you want to go ahead and, and you know speak on the project, whether it's a support or talk for your feedback, um, you can also do that as well. Um, the, the second question about... Um, Oh, look at that. I'm already seeing some submissions there. Um, the second question about, about engagement with the Native American community, we have been going around to um, plenty of organizations, um, including some of most, actually all of the mayor's advisory groups. So that's the Black advisory group, the Latinx advisory group, the uh, API, Latinx, et cetera. Um, so again, this is, this is still relatively early in the conversation. We, we kicked off this process in mid-September. Um, you know, we anticipate the conversations to be ongoing for like a decade until we, um, you know, finally have a new um, six blocks here. Um, so, so that's, that's good feedback. Um, we have communicated with advisory boards, um, but we can continue and we will continue that outreach, absolutely. Um, and the last part as to the historicity of these blocks, um, I think the conversation is actually focused on, on civic theater um, and the historic mm -hmm. portion of that. Um, not so much the 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 remaining parts of it. Um, we haven't had those kind of discussions, um, but but again, another good point that you bring up. Okay. My next. <laughs> okay, uh, Bill. Yeah, you're up. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, Jennifer, for inspiring uh, presentation, and and Chris for uh, uh, being here to answer some of our questions. Um, I guess this is more of an encouragement as you go forward. Um, if you really want to integrate the multiple blocks, but you're separating them as different development initiatives or ownerships eventually, um, it would, I think, import, be important to have some kind of master framework whether it's a formal plan or passed by resolution. So there's coordination before going to the individual actors because that would be very challenging with, if each block in particular was a different development entity or even multiple development entities uh, to really establish the integration in public spaces. And also don't be timid about the Surplus Land Act Oh, public space is not surplus. Um, transit hubs are not surplus. They are public purposes. And so if we have 
portions of the property that are really to be designated for public purposes be precise in what the city calls surplus, subject to the Surplus Land Act, and what isn't, what are other public purposes. They don't have to be a building necessarily to be a public purpose. Um, and, the, and then I guess my last question is, do you anticipate this being implemented as a um, P3 uh, design, build, finance, operate, maintain, similar to how Long Beach financed its civic center? Yeah, those are good questions. And I think that to, to the master plan point, I think that that's, that's one of the recommendations that Jennifer's group um, submitted to us. And that's, that's very well noted. Um, and um, uh, as to your question for the P3, again, it's still too early. These conversations started in September. Um, it's one of the options, whether it's a P3 or, um, you know, we, we, we're not even sure if we're going to be selling or leasing, you know, the, the five blocks. So there's a lot of questions um, still in terms of financing and stuff like that, um, that, that we're still figuring out. If, if you have uh, suggestions based on your experience, uh, we have, we're happy to um, listen to that as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to make it Saturday at the, um, the meeting then. Thanks. Perfect. <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, well, those are there's a lot of food for thought here. It seems like we hopefully will have a series of follow up conversations and discussions and presentations like this. Um, I am going to move on to Rob Quigley. That was a wonderful presentation, Jen. It was really inspirational. Oh, thanks, Rob. I mm -hmm. haven't I haven't been close to the project, and I was so fearful it would be thrown to the first design builder, um, and that would be it. <laughs> I, I'd like to make a suggestion um, about implementation and that it's, it's not too soon for your committee to be thinking about how this gets implemented over a long period of years with likely multiple developers. And, and the history of these kinds of projects, especially in San Diego, is that they go sideways after all this wonderful visionary work is done. It doesn't quite make it to the final project always for very logical, practical reasons. And I think the solution may be that there needs to be um, what you might call a czar of civicness. There needs to be at least one person who's in charge for the, not in charge, but monitors the project the entire time that has the confidence of the city council. Um, and that person's job is to make sure that the manifesto that you've outlined remains intact through all of the pushes and pulls and, and problems that the uh, rea that reality is going to uh, have as, as this thing moves forward. We don't have a city architect who would play this role. So it needs to be uh, created and it needs to be somebody who really understands urban design, understands the manifesto and can read architectural drawings <laughs> so that they can see they can see the negative coming. Uh, I would, Jen, I would nominate you for that position. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there needs to be somebody with your qualities and if you're unable to do it. But anyway, that's my, that's my two cents. I completely agree, Rob. Thanks so much. I mean, uh, the city staff are incredibly busy and um, they need the support of one person thinking about this project 24 hours a day and yeah. Chris really, really encourage us to figure that out. Yeah. And, and if I may, um, I'm not sure if, any, if many of you know Jay Goldstone, and he is the mayor's special advisor um, for, for the sports arena and for the Civic Center. Um, he was previously our chief operating officer, so he's very familiar with how the city operates. Um, and he's our, he's our, our top um, advisor on this project as well. Um, I do note, uh, you know, that the, the, the architectural side of it, which I, I agree, Jennifer, would be a great um, addition to that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm... well, I, I'm just thinking of my own experiences with the with the uh, the uh, central library, in that after the committee that selected the architectural team disbanded, um, and then the project finally got started years later, uh, uh, the city did a great job monitoring the budget and holding the mechanics of, this, of, the, of the project together. But there was really no one that I could go to um, who was a visionary, who you know, understood the, 
the difference between architectural magic and, and mundaneness. There was really no one I could go to uh, because there, we didn't have a city architect. And uh, there needs to be that someone on this project. Hmm. Thanks, Rob. And thanks uh, for your comments, Chris and Jen. Uh, I think we'll turn it over to Andrew Malik for his question, and then we'll go to the questions in the chat. And then Brandon Nash, uh, provided you all can stick around for a tiny bit longer. So Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I'd, I'd like to say, uh, again, wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, I think that um, both what uh, Bill and Rob said uh, prior to me, um, it, I, I will just reiterate. Um, I think process is important and I think um, a, a master plan and uh, is, is almost a, a step that cannot be skipped. Um, in fact, I'll be more certain in that. Uh, there needs to be a master planning process and I think there should be an RFP first to solicit uh, you know, one of the best master planners in the world to guide us through this. Um, and it will separate the civic space, as Bill suggested, from the private space, which developers would be building and organize these buildings in a way that, uh, you know, that, that really thinks about the whole as opposed to a bunch of different parts. Um, the second thought that I had that I think is, is sort of uh, maybe a, a question to you, Jen, is, um, you, you had relatively nebulous, uh, I, I don't mean that in a negative way, um, that uh, sort of a criteria in, in your manifesto. Um, and, you know, uh, clearly, you know, there needs to be some measurable um, criteria when there is a selection process for specific teams. Um, was, was that a conscious decision to leave it more open-ended? And, and do you feel like you're just the front end of the process or, or uh, Maybe you could speak to that. Sure. I think we are the front end of the process and yet our committee will um, proceed, right? We will be a part of um, every aspect of selection. Uh, the intent at the beginning was really to have conversation. I mean, we started in September. We were supposed, this was supposed to be a three month um, engagement. We're at month eight now. Um, it's just gotten more intense. And I think that the manifesto was meant to communicate to city council the importance of this project um, in the broad sense of the word. I do think that we can zero in now on um, specifics, although the NOA process certainly limits exactly what we can mandate, but being more specific, yes, when we meet with potential groups about what all those manifesto items really mean uh, for us as a community. And hopefully we can all build those specifics together because um, our committee is small but mighty, uh, but we need all of you. This is like one of the most exciting conversations I've had about this project and i'm sure betsy and chris can agree this is the moment where um we need your voice too to to dial in those specifics and uh, i think it's just the beginning really it's we've as a group expanded this whole process beyond i think chris what we thought it was going to be and um i think it, we're only at the beginning of that you're never going to get rid of us, Chris. <laughs> We're here for good. True. Thanks for those good questions, Andrew. We'll go ahead and we'll go on to Brandon, and then we'll close with um, Jack as the last question before we um, close out the meeting. So, uh, Brandon Nash. Hi, everybody. It's actually it's Dan Stewart. I'm sitting here with Brandon Nash. Uh, and Jason Mounty, and I just I wanted to maybe approach Rob's comment uh, from a slightly different angle. You know, time is often the enemy of projects like this, and there's a lot of enthusiasm built up, a lot of energy at the moment. Um, it's hard to sustain that over time. So, 
Um, does the group have a vision for an implementation schedule in recognizing that a master plan is likely a good, an important step? Um, is there an idea of the execution of this and the delivery of the RFPs or the RFQs out to the development community and uh, for the development of the uh, Civic Center itself? Yeah, that, um, that's a good point. And um, if, if you tune in tomorrow at the Land Use and Housing Committee, you'll see um, Jay Goldstone um, presenting on that timeline for, for the NOA and for construction, et cetera. Um, I think the dates that I can give you right now with, with some certainty is that we're, we're trying to go to, we will be going to Land Use and Housing Committee um, tomorrow at 1 p.m. After that, we're going to City Council on April 25th um, to declare, to, to officially declare these five blocks surplus. Um, and then sometime in early May, we will be releasing that notice of availability. Um, afterwards, where um, bidders will have 60 days, potentially more, um, to submit their proposals. And then after those 60 days, there will be a 90 day good faith negotiation period, um, which each with each of the responsive bidders. Um, so, and, and that'll be the, the initial, again, as prescribed by state law. Um, these are the processes that we have to follow. Um, and so that'll be bring us to about the end, year, end of the year. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll be figuring out um, uh, dates, you know, as we move forward. But those are the dates that I can, the process that we're following um, by state law. Thank you. Thank you, Steinberg Hart. All right, uh, Jack, we have your hand raised. Are you there with us, Jack? You're on mute if you're speaking. Mike, step me or correct me if I'm wrong about the fact that John Nolan proposed a civic corridor starting with the current county headquarters all the way to Balboa Park at one time. And I guess the question I have is that if Balboa Park is a cultural center, how should this connect to their cultural center between our civic center? I don't know if Jennifer wants. Uh, yeah. Well, Marty Poirier at one point with Andy Spurlock created this unbelievable chain of landscapes that connected Balboa Park to the downtown core. And I wish that project had happened, but we do have an opportunity to do it um, with arts and culture, with a sense of civic pride that we have in Balboa Park and we can have with our downtown core physically connecting them. I'm not sure if that's this project or, or a plan that, for instance, Marty could resurrect. Marty, please do. Marty, feel free to chime in. You had your hand raised anyway. Sure, thank you. Uh, again, can't overlook the congratulations to Jennifer and all the hard work her group did and this remarkable presentation today, as well as the heartfelt comments from everybody. This mm -hmm. uh, is uh, a group that, that gets it. Uh, and to that point, uh, I could return a little bit to Phil's first question. Uh, I was the site planner and landscape architect with the ZGF team in 2008. So indeed, uh, I put together, um, and it was a public meeting, to present the, uh, the sense of what happened in 2008. And to really cut to the chase, uh, we tried to demonstrate that at that point, design didn't matter, inclusiveness didn't matter, climate action didn't matter, and costs didn't matter. This project failed in 2008 because of political fear. Uh, one council person just rattled on about everything that could go wrong and got the council jittery and the project failed. Uh, all of us get everything Jennifer's talking about. What I believe she's doing and the group is doing that is gonna be the most successful is to meet 
as much as possible with the mayor and the city council members and have them start to understand and believe how wonderful our city is and why it deserves this and why these risks need to be taken. And if indeed they want to think that risk just means money, of course, greatness costs money. America's finest city seems to and should imply that you, it's worth more. And we are a great city and can be great. So I believe that all of us uh, don't have to worry about design. I think the comments by Rob, Bill, and others on having a guiding master plan are critical and essential. That will happen. That's in a, I don't want to uh, belittle any of this, but that's the easy stuff for us as designers. The hard stuff is the political strength and the help and education of our council members to fully believe and trust in this process. And Jennifer and her group have done a great job with that. So thank you all. That's Thanks so much, Marty. Yeah, really we, well said. We, we are in the process of offering meetings with city council members and we're really getting good response on that, I think, Chris. And you're right, absolutely right, Marty. It's it's speaking to them directly. That's really going to be important. Yeah. And if I may also add, you know, I think that the mayor has met con like quite a quite a few times with Jennifer and, and Betsy and each of the subgroup chairs um, uh, to discuss this project. This this is of course you don't have to convince the mayor that this this project needs to be great. Um, he certainly agrees to that. Um, the conversations are constant. Um, the meetings are constant, and and you know, we're we're definitely taking that that feedback from from the subgroup chairs and what we're hearing on the ground as well. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I think so. We're at one thirteen now. We we could try to squeeze in one more question. I know there's some hands raised, and there were some items in the chat that we might not have addressed. But I do want to give time to Betsy Brennan who is the CEO of the Downtown Partnership, which kind of brings a bunch of these different pieces together. Um, I think Betsy can close this out. Uh, if you guys are okay to hang around for a little bit more, can we squeeze in one more question? And if so, um, who is it? Because we've got, uh, Marty, you still have your hand up. Maybe that's from previously. Rob, you do as well. Maybe that is from previously. If you guys don't have more questions, then I am going to hand it over to our very own Betsy Brennan. Okay, thanks, Betsy. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. As I said in the chat, I'm unusually quiet today because I'm just listening. It's really important to hear from everybody and really love Jennifer's presentation and hearing from Chris and hearing from everybody here. I, I, I really couldn't agree with Marty more on really engaging our council members. Uh, our mayor is definitely really engaged in this process and leading us forward. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm an open book. I'd love to meet with some of you and, and hear your ideas and bring this thing forward. So I, I do a lot of work on land development. As many of you know, I'm a land use attorney by background. So I love how people and land interact. So I come from it and maybe at a different perspective than some of you, but I value really value everybody on this call very, very, very much and want to see this project happen this time. I was around in 2008. I was working for the city council then and um, very, very much want to see this project through fruition this time around and would love to pick your brains and understand what we can do this time. I want to see downtown vibrant. I want to see it walkable. I want to see people here 24 seven, all the things I, I say all the time, um, wherever you see me. Um, so let me know how we can do this. I've worked with many of you on, on many successful projects and some projects that haven't, haven't made it over the finish line. So let's make this one happen. Um, and Jennifer is amazing. And so are a lot of the people on this committee. And we have 
a, a lot of different constituencies. So how does this project work for each and every one of those constitu constituencies? How is this good for families? How is this good for people that need to get their passports? How is this good for open space? How is this good for the climate action plan? How is this good for transit? I mean, how does this work for every single facet of San Diego? And how can we make it work for the ones that we're not thinking about? The people that we aren't have around the table. We talked about the indigenous communities today. We talked about some of the historic communities today. Who aren't we thinking about that we need to think about and put at this table? So um, we talked about affordable housing, we, you know, but anyway, so let's get together and think about this. Let's energize each and every part of our community and make this something we're all proud of and is right in the middle of the heart of our city and is activated and is on the C Street corridor and is another part of our downtown that we all have talked about for 40 years. And um, let's activate that too. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to working with each and every one of you as we go forward, because um, I, I did see Jay's timeline and it looks like if this is the, if this is the timeline and I know some of you are like, what's the rush? But if this is the timeline, it shows maybe a 2029 or 2030 uh, time frame for, for moving into even one of these buildings. And that's, um, that's the fast track. So anyway, um, you can see that tomorrow at uh, Land Use and Housing. So thank you so much, Chris. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks to everybody else that's on the call today. So thank you. Gosh, thank you. I mean, uh, returning those thank yous back to all of you guys, to Jen, to Betsy, to Chris, thank you so much for being with us. We want to serve as sounding board. We want to, you know, we're an interdisciplinary group. So if you have, you know, anything you want to throw to us, we have um, ways that we all communicate in even an informal manner. So it doesn't have to be you always coming and doing a presentation. We want to um, uh, serve you guys as well. Um, as citizen architects and landscape architects and planners. Um, with that, I do want to say to everyone that next month we do have our first in-person um, RDAC meeting. It's going to be on the same day, May 10th, the uh, second Wednesday of the month, um, but it will be at 5.30 p.m. at Carrier Johnson's office in downtown. We will include all the information um, necessary for you guys to get here. Um, but we're asking everybody to register so we make sure to have enough seats for you guys. Um, we're going to have some um, light drinks and um, apps. And we're actually going to have a really engaging um, presentation led by Frank Walden. It's about um, going to be centered around one of his projects in Del Mar, which is actually a builder's remedy project, which is, you know, a, a good topic of conversation. Um, and we're going to be asking questions on how um, design and policy and um, equitability and sustainability um, can also respect existing communities. So we're really looking forward to seeing you guys all in person next month. Um, so yeah, be there, mark your calendars. And thanks again to, to this group. This was an awesome presentation. Thanks for Thanks having us. And, um, if you want to expand this conversation a little this week, you could attend Friends of San Diego um, Architecture on Saturday, Mike. That is correct. And a further discussion is one of the conversations that Chris and Jennifer talked about and Betsy expanding. And I think, you know, I raised my hand too. Uh, the last comment going to Marty's plan that he talked about, we're looking also at the San Diego High School lease and what that presents as an opportunity. Betsy's very involved in that. And that connects to part of this master planning idea for what the Civic Center Corps is about. So looking at how all these ideas connect is that the timing is right, the world of design capital community, the framework or the schedule for all of us to do the great things that we need to do to make the city what we want it to be. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer, for that last line. But see you Saturday. <laughs> see you Saturday. All right. Thanks, all. See you soon. Thanks for coming. Thanks Thank for having everyone. us. Thank you.